Welcome to Goldfish on Games. And economics is rarely thought of a fun subject or important to most games. But there was one developer that decided that it was going to be the cornerstone to one of its titles. They wrapped it up in a wonderful city building title, added beautiful graphics, and absolutely lovely sound, and that game obviously became The Settlers by Blue Byte. Now, this is the 93-94 release and not any of the other versions that have the exact same name. First release on the Amiga in 1993, it was quickly followed up in 94 with the MS-DOS release. In most of the world, they use exactly the same box for both releases, and you can only really tell the difference by looking at the specs on the bottom, though the US had to be different, and they got a new puntastic name, Surf City, Life is Feudal, and came with a OH MY GOD KILL IT, KILL IT WITH FIRE, KILL IT QUICK. In the box you'll find quite a beefy manual, which you will need to keep to hand, because not only does it tell you how to play the game, but it's also its copy protection. Yep, that's quite a big book for that. It also came with this nice and handy codex, which explains to you what all the icons are. Last but not least is the floppy disks. Three for the Amiga and just two for the PC. Thankfully, both versions allow for hard drive installations. The game starts with a nicely animated intro that, while well, seems to be there for the sake of being there, it is a nice little mood setter, and you can always skip it. On the Amiga this is done by just not inserting the first disc, and on PC you can use the quick launch batch file. But straight after it, you get the copy protection, which you're going to have to start looking up that manual. And then you get to see the UI, which is possibly the most wood grain thing I have ever seen in my life. And from the main menu, we can see what makes Settlers unique already. We have 30 pre-made scenarios that will pit you against one to three other lords, as well as a free mode where you can define who you play against and randomly generate your map. Amazingly, it doesn't stop there. There's also an option for a two-player split-screen mode. Now, this is actually supported on both platforms, and is actually quite unique. There's not many two-player, mouse-driven games on the PC, as far as I'm aware. It was far more common on the Amiga, mostly due to its design. And I can tell you, I played this a lot with my mates. We loved Settlers. It was one of those great games that we could just sit there, play, and just sort of chat and listen to music, or watch TV. The PC version, being a year later than the Amiga, also supports SVGA mode, which allows you to see much more at once, and is actually a great boon for when you play it in two-player split-screen. But... It suffers from a MIDI based music, rather than the Amiga's sample based mods, and it has a slightly lower colour depth as well. But either way, you can't go wrong with Settlers. If you never had the privilege of being exposed to this game or its series, then the idea is that you need to build up your city to be a fully working economy. This allows you to take on all the other opposition on the map. And you might ask yourself, well why do we need a working economy? Everything in the game requires some form of resource to make or build. For example, just about everything requires wooden planks. You'd expect we'd have to put a woodcutter down, but that's not the end of it. The woodcutter just gives us logs, and we need planks. And so to turn the wood into planks, we need a sawmill. It won't take long for your woodcutter to deforest the area. And this is where the forester comes into play, as he plants new trees, which then means that you've more or less got an unlimited resource when it comes to wood. Now that's quite unique in the Settlers series, as most resources are limited, 
such as stone, which either has to be quarried from stone found on the map, or it can be produced from a mine. Well, so far, it's not that much deeper than a classic 90s RTS game. So where does this complexity come in? Well, let's take a look at possibly the largest dependency tree in the game, and one that you're gonna have to crack if you're gonna win. We need knights to defend and conquer territory. And to get a knight, we need three things. A sword and shield, as well as a free settler. The weapons are built at a blacksmith, but he needs pig iron and coal to do his job. Pig iron comes from a forge, who requires both iron ore and coal. These are both produced at mines. The catch here is that miners have to eat, and they have three options. There is fish that are caught by fishermen, there is meat which comes from a butcher who in turn has to get a pig from a pig farmer, and the pigs need wheat to eat and those come from a farmer. The wheat can also be turned into flour at the mill, and when passed to the baker he can produce the final food that is bread, and the settlers are born at either castles or storehouses. Now this isn't even the end of this chain as none of those buildings will operate unless there's a worker inside. And workers are created when we get a spare settler and we have the right tool for the job. Those tools are created at toolsmiths, who will use the pig iron and wood, and as we learned earlier, the wood comes from sawmills. And when all that is in place, we will have the workers required to operate the buildings, which can then produce the goods, that will eventually work their way all the way up the chain to produce a knight. Ooh. Thankfully, this is the most complex dependency tree in the game. And while it might seem quite daunting at first, it's not something you're going to have to jump at and attack straight away. You can take your time with it. The game will allow you to make mistakes as well. If you ruin your resources and your economy, the game will initiate the emergency program where resources will only go to the buildings that will help you get out of that problem. So the game really does want you to succeed, and will try its damnedest to make sure that you do. With all the different buildings that we're going to need to place to get a fully working city, we will require lots of usable space. But when we start off, we've only got a small patch of territory to work with, and this is noted by the boundary markers you see around the side. You can expand these boundaries by placing military buildings. These require a soldier to occupy. Thankfully, you typically start off with a healthy amount of resources in both tools, soldiers and various workers, so you can expand and get yourself going quite quickly. Though, as you go through the levels, this will change quite a bit. And in free mode, you get to define how much resources each of the players gets when they start, as well as how aggressive the AI is and the growth rate of your citizens, which really allows you to tailor the difficulty level. You might think that placing the buildings is the most important aspect of the game, and to be honest, you'd be wrong, because the most important thing in any game of settlers to nail is the road network, and you define where the roads go, when they branch, and where any local storehouses might end up. This is vitally important, as everything has to be delivered, it's very easy to create bottlenecks and end up having all your goods having to be delivered down a single road because that is where the nearest building with the resources that you require resides. You really need to take into account the terrain as there's height to it and getting your settlers to walk up a hill will be much slower than walking across a flat bit of land. But if you're going up into the mountains to put mines in, you're going to have to go uphill at some point. Water can also be a big obstacle where you may have to go around it. If it's a small enough body of water, you can actually put a boat crossing on it, which will be much faster, but they can only take goods across with them. You cannot move people across on boats. Now you might think that the obvious answer is to have as much roads as possible, but that can also come back to haunt you as badly as having too few, because every single road has to be manned by a settler. And if the growth rate isn't high enough, then it can be a long time before you get a free settler to man that road. And every settler on a road is accounting for one of your settlers that you can have, and might mean that you won't be able to get a knight or a builder. 
as there is a maximum number of settlers you can have in any game. The upper limit of this is defined by a 16-bit number, and this is spread across all the players in that map. It is also limited by the amount of free memory you have. So if you're on an original Amiga 500 with just half a megabyte of RAM, you're going to be far more limited than if you've got a whole megabyte of chip RAM or got an expansion card. This is the same on PC where you're going to want to have as much expanded memory as you can get. The manual has a really nice table that explains what you can expect from the various memory configurations. The slower pace of the game can be a mixed blessing as it gives you plenty of time to react to what's going on around you, but at the same time it feels like you could be just dragging and dragging, waiting on stuff to happen, which can be a real pain in a two-player game, where I've had some games that have measured in actual days. Talking of the two-player mode, it was done by each player using their own mouse, or if you didn't have a second mouse, they could use the keyboard, and the screen itself was split in half. This made the SVGA mode on the PC a very nice option to have. And it also took advantage of the fact that it was split screen by allowing you to set a mode where the sound effects would come out of the speaker on your side of the screen. So you knew that that alert was for you and not anyone else. Working out where there's issues in your city can actually be quite easy as there's loads of graphs and charts that give you hints of what's going on and allow you to drill into the data. This allows you to fine tune where your resources go. Say you need more tools, then you can put all your pig iron and wood into tool making. You can even tell the toolsmith which tools you need. This should mean you have everything you need at your fingertips in a very clear and concise way to allow you to do the best job you can with your city. One area of the game that isn't as complex as the rest is combat. When you've built up enough forces, You'll pick a garrison to attack and set the number of knights you want to send. The maximum number you can send is based on the number of knights you have near the target and the defence level that you set. Once that's done, the attack is started and everything is left up to the computer to handle. The strength of your knights is based on their experience and your overall morale. The morale is based on how many gold bars you've stored in your military buildings and the morale only affects your attacking ability as you always defend at full strength, which can make attacking during the early parts of the game quite difficult, especially if you don't have overwhelming numbers on your side. And even then, it can be quite easy for you to lose all your knights to one well-trained knight on your opposing side. The end goal of any map is to conquer a large percentage of it and then sack your enemy castle. Hopefully this has gotten you all revved up and ready to play some settlers, and there's some good news on that front, it's not hard to find a box copy of the game for either the Amiga or the PC, and it plays really well on most hardware and emulators. Annoyingly, out of the classic Settlers games, it's the only one not to have shown up on GOG, and I think the copy protection is the reason for it. But you will find the Settlers History Edition on Uplay. It supported the DOS version, two modern windows, and has a number of useful improvements, such as being able to speed up time. The only real downside is the fact that it still uses the MIDI music and has the PC intro rather than the much nicer Amiga version. It also misses out on some of the nicer touches from the Amiga, like the spinning stars in the menu. It's a pity they couldn't have taken the Amiga as the base and then added to it with the SVGA mode to create the best version overall. It also has a couple of new bugs that they've introduced, but hopefully they'll continue to update it and this will end up being the best version to play. Well, with everything I've said, would I still recommend this game? Well, yes and no. For the Amiga, it's a landmark title and very unique amongst all its games. On PC, it was bettered by pretty much most of its sequels, in particular Settlers 2, which is just possibly the peak of the series, in my opinion. So, if you want to know where the series came from, you definitely have to check this out, because it is a wonderful game. But if you want to play something more accessible, then look at some of the sequels. And on that slightly uncommittal note, I've been the Gouldfish, that was the Settlers, and this has been Gouldfish on Games. And until next time, I'm going to play a bit more of the game. So, see ya.